He is worthy. And uh, as I listened to that and sang it with you, it's very personal. It's what He's done for me. It's my blessing. It's my experience with God. And I think that all of us have much to be thankful for. And it's so easy to overlook the blessings of God. So easy to overlook His favor. So easy to overlook the good things that when you stop and consider them, they're grand things. But we have become so accustomed to the favor of the Lord that we just we forget to say thank you. We forget to say thank you. One of the things that I gained in my little autopsy of Lot that's in the book that is being released. Abram gave Lot the opportunity to choose the first. When the king of Chedorlaomer had taken him captive, Abram came and rescued him. There is a single reality that I found interesting. The king of Sodom told Abram, thank you. And Lot never did. There's something about lacking appreciation. And those who lack appreciation for others never have appreciation for their Savior either. Praise God. We have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to be thankful for in regard to each other. Praise the Lord. I'm glad for you. Praise the Lord. Look at somebody and just tell them, I'm glad for you. Now look back at them and be honest and tell them, as strange as you are, I'm still glad for you. I see some of you not being real obedient with that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Some of you perhaps are being too honest with it at the same time. Thank the Lord. You were given an opportunity that you would just been waiting for. We have many people that are sick. And we do have people who are very concerned, as I think all of us should be, regarding the coronavirus. And my suggestion to any who feel that way is to uh, be comfortable at home. Don't put themselves at risk if you have health issues. Uh, please don't, don't uh, again, put yourself in a risky situation. But uh, God knows, and uh, he's, he's in charge, and He's in control. Let's pray for several in our church who have the coronavirus. Let's pray, to Pam, pray for Pam Eddings' mother who has it. Uh, to date, the cases that we've had are... Uh, comparably milder than some others. By far, they're mild, milder than some others. And so we're very thankful for that. Uh, Juanita is sick. I don't think it's the coronavirus, but uh, she has been very sick, but is feeling better. And uh, so it's not here. Let's pray for others. Let's pray for Michael Bennett. Let's pray for Alice Moulter. She needs healing. Julie Townsend, not here tonight, needs healing for her shoulder. Uh, I miss seeing Sister McCarthy. Hallelujah. And, uh, you know, if you're going to live that long, do it that way. I know some folks that get mature and crotchety. But she has remained sweet. And I miss seeing Sister McCarthy. And uh, let's pray for um, Juanita's sister-in-law. She has the COVID and is not doing well. And continue to pray for the process to purchase our new building. Inspections continue. We've had uh, the HVAC guy out and, and uh, our realtor is doing a great job in helping make sure all of that gets taken place, taken care of. And I'm very, very thankful for that as well. Because there's a lot going on without having to add that to the list right now. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. I'm very thankful for your goodness. I'm glad for the mercy of God and the touch of heaven. 
I ask that you would speak, Lord, that you would touch, that you would help, that you would come into someone's life. And God, that you would guide the steps of men and women as they come to you. Oh, Lord, help us in our praise. Help us in our worship. God, we have people that are sick. I pray for Juanita's family member who has the COVID and is not doing well at all. Let's, God, heal her. Make her well. I pray, Lord, for others in our church that you protect them, cover them, watch over them, look out for them. In the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for it. I trust you in it. I believe you for it. In Jesus' name, and I thank you for revival. I thank you for Book of Acts revival. I thank you for the ministry of the Holy Ghost. Thank you for home Bible studies being taught, miracles that are happening. To God be the glory. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. And again, tonight, there is a wonderful spirit of praise and worship in the house. And I'm thankful for that. Bless you. You can be seated. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just kind of, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. And uh, we'll see how this goes. There's some things that I want to say and share with you tonight that I do think are helpful. Please be in prayer for uh, the teaching that I do. Uh, on Monday through Friday, the book of Acts. And uh, I, I don't have any idea if anybody else, well, I do because I get some feedback. But um, I, I'm getting a lot out of my preparation and study. I'm probably getting more out of it than everybody else put together. And uh, so I'm, I'm very thankful for that. But now, the truths that are there I, I, I'd like to have a Springfield, Missouri-based audience of 500 that watch every one of those. And they're out there. Hallelujah. And we'll figure out how to get the promotion, get the word to the right place. And uh, it's, it's coming. Hallelujah. So pray about that. And uh, like I said, I'm not going to be deep. And I do not anticipate that I'll be long. And uh, this is just going to kind of be family night. And sometimes family nights can be challenged. Sometimes they can be disconcerting. And uh, it would be a good night if we were just going to have a saints meeting to just cover all the A to Z of everything everybody does wrong. But that's not going to be the context of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, we, we're just, uh, we'll just let that lay for another day and announce a saints meeting on Tuesday. And invariably, every time I've had one of those, we have had just all kind of lost people just show up out of the woodwork. I don't know if the Lord was trying to protect his people from a frustrated preacher or just what the deal was. But, uh, but anyway, hallelujah. What a great time to be in God's church. What a great day to be serving the Lord. Praise God. When you read the book of Deuteronomy, one of the things to realize about the book of Deuteronomy is that nothing new happens. The book of Deuteronomy is not history. It's a rehash of history. It is a restatement of things that happen and are reported on in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And Deuteronomy is actually a book of remembrance. And it is Moses taking time to reflect on and recall the various things that happened in Israel as they departed from Egypt and began to move toward the Promised Land. So when you read these events, Moses is restating experiences and events, most of which had taken place in the book of Exodus. Okay, so I want us to look at Deuteronomy, the second chapter. And I'm going to use this from several different angles tonight. So just, just bear with me. Uh, this will not be as... Uh, much an exposition or even an exegesis of scripture as 
I sometimes um, aim for. We're just going to talk a little bit and uh, see what we can gain together. Okay, so here they are, and they are at Mount Seir. It's not been long since they crossed over the Red Sea. And uh, the Bible says, Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spake unto me. And we compassed Mount Seir many days. Now, there's no way to know what many days look like. So we'll just leave it many days. At the end of many days, the Lord spake to me, saying, you have compassed this mountain long enough. Turn you northward. Now, where they were at was not Egypt, which was a real blessing. They were no longer slaves. They were not building uh, cities for Pharaoh. But at the same time, Mount Seir was not what God had promised to Abraham. It was not the promised land. It was a place where that they had been delivered and brought to. But sometimes it's easy to get comfortable having escaped one thing without having arrived at the new thing. Having escaped one thing, but never having arrived at the new thing. And so after many days, the Lord spoke to Israel and said, okay, you've been here long enough. Turn you north. And he gave further instruction, if you were to read the rest of the chapter, about places that they were not to lay hold to and lay claim to and things that they were not to imagine as their own and, and all of that. But I want to focus on this little thought tonight, that God has his people in motion. God has his people ready to move. God is saying to Calvary, he's saying to me, he's saying to you, you've been here long enough. Turn you northward. And I'm not talking about the few blocks north where we will in a few days inhabit a new building. I'm talking about a northward toward what God really wants us to be and become in this city. Because that's really what the work of God is all about. It's not about us feeling that we have arrived. It's not about us feeling like that, well, we're, we're doing pretty good. But instead, it's this, are we doing what God wants us to do in this city? As I've studied the book of Acts, the second chapter, a recurring thought that's come from some of the fellows that I've read after is this. What about our church looks like the Acts 2 church? Would there be anything that could ever happen among us that was cause a multitude to come together and to be confounded because of what they saw God doing in us? Is He not the same God? Does He not have the same power, the same ability? Let's let, God, let's let Him be God. And every man a liar. Let's believe his report. And what I sense, and, and, and it seems like that I'm ringing this bell everywhere I go. It, I, I, I preached about it in Williamstown. I, I have talked about it here. I've talked about it online. But what I sense is that there is just out on the horizon a supernatural, a supernatural opportunity for God's people. But I also feel that we have to be uncomfortable with camping at Mount Seir in order to possess 
and to be permitted into what God is offering and what God is making available. And so this little verse is more of a of a of just kind of a starting point. I want to challenge your thinking. We need the supernatural. Our city needs the supernatural. The religious community here needs the supernatural. There needs to be a divine visitation of God that breaks out on the Wesleyans and the Presbyterians and the Catholics and the Assemblies of God and the Pentecostals and everybody else in this city. We need the supernatural divine intervention of Almighty God. And I refuse to accept that he is so small that we could somehow limit his capacity or overtax him in what he could do among us. Hallelujah. So let's let God use us. Let, let's, let's let God take us into places in the New Testament. The term is spiritual gifts. And in Corinthians, we are introduced to spiritual gifts. And in those spiritual gifts, there is this illumination that comes that these things are given us for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ. You say, well, we, we need the supernatural in order for the world out there. And, and, and that's certainly going to happen when there are the gifts of miracles and the gifts of healing and if you're watching tonight online, we believe that Jesus is a healer. And if you need healing, we would love to pray for you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. I'm not a faith healer, but I know who heals. And His name is Jesus. Praise God. We need to anticipate that. But... In this edifying, as we are built up, it makes his church healthier. And a healthy body, a healthy congregation, will always be more impacting in its community than a sickly, weary, and wounded group of people. We need wellness. We need help. We need to be built up in the things of God because a healthy church is going to be a growing church. A growing church. So what, what I'm challenging you, and I, I talked to the preachers that are part of um, my little Ministry Monday audience, and I have a virtual assistant who actually puts that on 40 or 50 different pages on Facebook. So I get responses from all over the world and people that are all kinds of theological background. But there is a rising hunger. There's a rising hunger that we can't just keep being church as usual, preaching good sermons, singing good songs, and bother the devil. There's got to be the grandness of the glory of God. There has to be the power of God. There has to be a demonstration and a display of the Spirit of God. And part of what I felt to talk to that group about is that regardless of our experience and our limitations, perhaps you have been used in tongues and interpretation of tongues, or you've been used in the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, where that you just move over to somebody and you, God, I think has given me a word for you and, and, and you can do with this what you want. You can apply it as you would like. If he has used you in those things, then number one, be more sensitive than you have ever been. Knock the calluses off your soul. You know what bank robbers do when they were using, when, when they could break into vaults at the bank and they turned the tumbers? You know what they would do? They would file down their fingers until they bled, where that they could get ultimate sensitivity. Of every nerve. You know why God can't do some things with us? We got calluses on our soul. We need to put some sandpaper on our spirit. 
We need to let some things be brushed off and get them out of the way where that we can feel what God is doing and we're not afraid to do it. So be available for what He has used you in, but at the same time, follow the breadcrumbs forward to the next level of what God wants to do with you and in you. You say, well, I might be out of order. Well, we'll take care of that later. It's not going to blow the church up. If it has, if it would have done that, Corinth would have been, my Lord, that would have been a mess. Let's let God use us. Let's make our, and let's move beyond fear. We need, uh, back in the 50s, there was this movement that was called the Latter Rain Movement, and it really got off track because it became extremist in the sense that that was the expectation. That was what was anticipated. Every single service that was going to be this, well, I'm not looking for that because that's not the way it happened in the book of Acts. But I refuse to allow some who have gone to such extremes one direction to limit me or to limit any of us from saying he still does it. He's going to do it with us. He's going to do it among us. It's our time to lay hold to this. Praise the Lord. And, uh, you know, there will be some services where there are no operation of the gifts of the Spirit. There will be times it will be dead as a doorknob and all of that. It's just part of, part of being part of the church. Now, like I said, I'm going to look at this from several different directions today. That was the deep part. So if you're checking out at the end of the deep part, well, you can go on, I guess, because the next part of this will be a little different. Um, moving. Time to turn north. Now, Pastor Butler's talked about it. I've talked about it. I'll talk about it tonight. We'll talk about it several more times about moving day. Because, barn the unexpected, 60 days from tonight, we will have our first service on North Park. Now, in passing, we have talked a little bit about what we hope to accomplish in preparing that building for our entry. And there's, there's quite a bit that we hope to do. And some will be dependent on both time and money. But there's a lot of it that will just be sweat equity. You know, I can run a weed eater uh, and quite a few other things um, that don't include any skill. Now, if it requires any skill to build or to paint or to do any of that, then if you see me trying it, you say, now, Pastor, let me take care of that um, because that's not my gig. But there's things that, as we move into it, are going to require people who know. It's going to require men like Joe White, Joel, uh, Michael Bennett, Mike Bennett, uh, others. We have others. Karen, we're going to have to have men and women who know how to build and they're willing to sweat and willing to do some of those kind of things. And, and so we're going to need it. We're going to need the help. And there will be about two and a half weeks between the time that we close on this building until we have that first service there. Um, and so we're going to communicate. We're going to communicate. We're going to communicate. Over and over. I heard one time that in order for a group of people to really get the communication, it has to be said seven times, and there will still be some folks who won't get it. And I think there's probably a lot of truth to that. So you heard it already. We're projecting our service, our first service there being on Sunday, November the 8th. Okay, so getting ahead of things. Our services on Wednesday. October the 28th, Sunday, November the 1st, and Wednesday, November the 4th, will be online only. Okay. Sound stuff's got to be moved over there. 
And you can't just do that overnight. I mean, if we had folks that didn't have other stuff to do and jobs and careers and, and all of that, then, yeah, we could get it done maybe in three or four days. But that's not where we're at. And so we will have, and then the second component of that is that, is that on those Wednesday nights, we will want to free up people who have skills and we will use those as work nights and cleaning nights and uh, building nights for those who can do that kind of stuff. And uh, we'll, we'll just, and again, I realize that all of that will be eating into the online crowd, but we're moving towards something. Okay, And, and so you, you have to do some things. Now, let me just get us ready. I've done this twice in regard to moving into a new building. And uh, there is no great need for us to try to go into this on November the 8th planning a big bang. It ain't going to happen unless God does it. And if God's going to do it, then he can use amazing grace and I'll fly away in songs that we've sung 9,264 times to do it. Because I've done it twice and both times we set up for the Big Bang to have a little whiz. Nothing happened. Instead, everybody sat around and they thought, well, I, I or the building we built, I, I never, I remember, I remember sitting on the platform, and, and I was watching. The choir was singing. We'd been in for a week or so, and there was a guy set far over in the right corner, a very good man, faithful, loved God, been part of the church for years, and I was watching him, watching his head move. And while we were praising Jesus, he was counting how many light bulbs there were in the ceiling. Well, now that's hard to overcome. So you just have to put it in perspective. It takes a while to create the comfort zone. And so just relax and, you know, you'll get there and you'll think, my word, I wish it was back in the gym. At least God was there. But he'll move over there too eventually. He'll discover that we're no longer at this address and, and make the change. He show up a Sunday or two, and there's nobody here. He'll, he'll say, "Well, where'd they go?" Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm telling, Ed, uh, I, I have been, <laughs> I have had this privilege with church planners when I was working with North American Missions, and they, brother, can we're having such a big day. We've built this building, and we're gonna, and we need you to be here our first Sunday. And I try to caution them. I'd say, listen, son, let's let's do this three months. Oh no, we want you. We're it's going to be a blow, and we'd get there. And again, the Lord hadn't got their forwarding address yet. He he uh, he didn't know where we were at. <laughs> and uh, poor church planner pretty often would say, oh, "Brother Coon, we've been having great church. I don't know what happened today." Well, son, I tried to tell you, but you wouldn't listen. When we get there. Try several different spots to sit before you decide, this is my perch. And we all get a perch eventually. That's the way humans are. We find our spot. Um, I'll try several different places. I, I, at times, have just found my spot about halfway back. That's okay. Somebody said, well, don't you need to be where people can know that you're the preacher? Well, I know that I'm the preacher. I don't need them to tell me. If I'm preaching that night and Brother Butler's not, they'll, they'll know. Eventually, they'll say, that's that guy who sat by me. What's he doing up there now? And that's part of the mystique of it. That's what kind of makes it fun. Is guy says, well, I just thought you was the janitor here. And they let you preach? Will they let me preach next Sunday? 
Take your time. Now, you know that I'm not too much of a pusher when it comes to pressing you to praise and worship. I prefer to exemplify what is desired rather than do the two bits, four bits, six bits, a dollar, all for Jesus, stand up and holler business. Um, if I have to do that for you to find something to love Jesus about, then your lover of Jesus is broke. When we're in that setting, we may have to do a little more pushing and a little more exhorting to get you where you're not counting light bulbs. And so, if we, if we do some of that. But I'm going to try out running the aisles. I think, I've, now I'm not saying November the 8th. I want to find where the spots in the carpet are at that I might stumble over. But I think I've easily got two laps in me. I'm going to try it on. I'm going to boogie for Jesus. I got some new dance steps that just won't work on this tile. If you've not been to a Pentecostal church, you just have to go. I'm not, I'm not talking about one that says they're Pentecostal. I'm talking about one that's really Pentecostal, where they expect saved folks to speak in tongues as the Holy Ghost gives the utterance and where they anticipate the miraculous and where preachers sometimes get a little wow, radical. You, you need to, it may scare you slap to death, but you need to try it. We're moving into the immense. Now we're in a big room here. But we used to be in something totally that was about, what, 6,000 square feet? The part of this that we're going to be using has 30,000 square feet. That's a lot of room. Thank God for it. Now here's where I start to need your help. I want to move now in our thinking past cutting shrubs and painting and whatever else we end up doing. I want us to think about being present in that building on November the 8th. What do we need to do to be ready, not for us, but for the visitors who will definitely be there? Because they're going to be there that Sunday and the next one and the next one and every Sunday till the first of the year and then there's going to be more coming. And So we need to think about this. I'm, I'm very interested in the way it's all going to look. But I'm also very interested in the way we're going to act. Not in the sense of the kind of church we have, but I'm interested in how we're going to act in welcoming and in doing a good job with people saying, you know what, I think I'd like to go back. So what are some of the things that, that when you help me now? Okay. <laughs> okay, well, William, you're going to stand right beside me, and you're going to remember all of their names for me. I've got a good name, remember. It's called Write It Down. Okay, a welcome packet. Somebody make notes here. Welcome packet. We we had one there, obviously. That's out of date. Don't need that anymore. Okay, a welcome packet. What are some other things? Need, need greeters, door, parking lot, kind of guiding the way into this thing. You know, <laughs> the way that building's built, <laughs> You may need somebody saying, come on, there's, there's more in here. You know, we will need signs, yeah, directing, and we'll need to do that right, professionally, looking good, big enough, nursery, 
Oh, God. More preachers have backslid over nurseries than over women. Yes, greeters, not just greeters, but greeters with a smile and a breath me. <laughs> yes, and, and research says that they have made up their mind before the preacher ever says the first word that he will say. Okay, so that first impression business, Carla? A designated prayer room. Yes. And that, that may have. Hey, guy, you men are permitted to talk. Yeah, yeah. Right. Let them have the best spot. There are none of us anymore who would say, that's my seat. You've got to leave that spot. Did that once or twice, but that. Move in, yes, move inside. Make it easier for the new people where that they don't have to climb over you. And uh, that's that's important. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see when we get in there. We know about what it seats. Uh, we'll see whether we look lost in it. I don't think we will. Um, if, if the coronavirus has let up any, then, um, then we'll... We'll be back where, but, you know, again, if, if it's like what we have dealt with tonight and what we dealt with last Sunday, then then we may have to say we're going to use the two center sections or something. We'll figure that out later. Okay, what else? Consistency and welcome. Good point. Yeah, it can't be hit or miss. Can't be. Right. Okay, here's here's something that we really have to think about going into this is that as a church body, we move from a six thousand square foot building to a thirty thousand square foot building with a wonderful kitchen. Full gymnasium. We have not yet grown five times larger. And yet we are going to be serving and servicing and ministering in a building that is five times larger. Well, where are you going with that, Pastor? I'm going here with this, that we're going to need all hands on deck. I mean, everybody. And almost everybody is going to be doing more than one thing for a while. Um, hopefully, you're not the parking lot greeter and then you run up the hill to open the door as well where we can have both of those covered but we're going to need help and we're going to need it to be pretty organized okay can you see what I'm getting at because okay here's here's what I see when I walk into that building number one it's a long way from that front door to a pew to sit on we have elders who can't make that journey now, they used wheelchairs. If they leave those chairs, we're set. If they're not, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get chairs. But we need people who know how to push a wheelchair. You say, well, anybody can push a wheelchair. Well, there are some people who can push them, and if they see somebody else is also pushing, they decide to have a race. Well, that's not conducive to church growth. 
So we, we have to think about it. You say, Pastor, you're being silly. No, things you think about ahead of time save you from having to fix later. And so getting these things taken care of. Um, the nursery that Carla so kindly mentioned. is right inside the front door to the left. It's a long way. Now, there, there is a deal, I'm assuming it works, where that every child gets a number, and if there's a difficulty with a child, a number shows up on a little board that's up there, and so the parent can go and take care of Atticus or Chevelle or whoever it is that's not happy. But still, it's a long way. It's a long way. And now... One of the safety factors is that that uh, the building is is well cameraed. So in the sound booth, uh, there are I don't know twelve different camera angles, and they can all be seen at the same time. But at the same time, it's easy to get distracted. We will need somebody pretty well all during church who is out toward the front of the building, toward the entryway. Okay, so we didn't have to do that over yonder. Well, no, we didn't. Welcome to our new world, I guess. We're we're moving up. We passed this mountain long enough. Time to move. Time to move. One of the things that I saw in Williamstown that I thought we need to think about is that. They had their pre-service prayer from 9.15 to 9.45, freeing up everybody to then go do something else from 9.45 to 10. Now, for me, Sundays, I'm up at 5-something usually, so 15 minutes earlier, won't matter, although lately I've been scrambling like a wild person to get here remotely on time. For others, that might be more of a challenge. But we're going to need lots of people available from 945 until 10 o'clock on Sundays. And so we'll, we'll have to think about that. Several have mentioned prayer. Where are we going to pray? Well, I... Probably at this point in the, um, I don't know, maybe the fellowship hall, um, the kitchen, the, I mean, if, if we come up with something better, it, there are too many of us in prayer to fit into the biscuit room. Thank God there's too many of us praying to fit in that room, but Jim's definitely big enough. Yeah, Jim's almost too big. Uh, you know, you have to get folks hollering in one another's ear uh, for us to even know we're in there. And of course, we're, we're speaking to God, so you can do that almost anywhere. Should be able to, anyway. The other thing that we need to think about, and this will only be decided as we get closer, is just now the recommendation in regard to children and youth ministry is that churches not do children and youth ministry because of the coronavirus. Because that's where it is easily passed. Now, that may change in the next few weeks. It may change in the next few, or we may just decide to do it anyhow. And if we do, we do. And if we do and we have it go bad, we'll claim it having gone bad with Brother Butler and I standing up here in front or over there in front singing, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Because we will have been the one that made the decision to do that. And we're not going to pass the buck about it. But that's a decision to be made down the road. I know that our children and our young people are ready. And I know I'm ready. 
I'm ready for all of this to be done, actually. And you are too. And it will be. I'm not sure when. Okay, so you've given Brother Butler and I quite a bit to think about. And how do we position? How do we get ourselves ready to do all of this? How, how do we, and to do it well, you know, maybe do a run through on the Sunday before or, or the Wednesday before and make sure, okay, here's, you know, somebody comes up and they need a wheelchair ride. Who does that? Because you see, if the person who's at the door becomes the wheelchair person, then there's nobody at the door. So you have to have kind of a, you have to have some systems in place. And uh, I, I like systems, I uh, like things done well, like things done right. Um, but for a while, and, and the church is going to grow, I'm just excited about what God's going to do. I am so excited about it. Um, for a while, we may have to use some people doing some things that they don't look like they have had the Holy Ghost for 42 years. Now, I'm not talking about on the platform or teaching a class, but you don't have to be real spiritual to push a wheelchair if you know not to have a race with the thing. We're getting deep now, aren't we? This, this is, I, you just, you know, I made a mistake earlier when I said the deep part was over. This is the part that we really need. This is, so we're, we're going to have to, we're going to have to, we're going to have to find everybody willing to work and put them to work. Hallelujah. I have a friend who has not served God in many years, and today I sent him a note. I said, we bought this building, and we're going to need help cleaning it up. Will you come help for two days just because I've been a good enough friend to you? He's ignored me so far. Now I know how much I mean to him. Though I'm going to say that I won't imagine that, that he just hadn't got it yet or something. But uh, anyway, boy, when I look at all of that, man, a main auditorium and a gym and an unused wing where the, the foyer can be and the prayer room and there can be some additional restrooms built that will be closer to the main auditorium and there could be kind of a covered portico out that back on the south where people could drive through and let their elders out and then the parking lot up on the hill paved it's already got gravel under it so you can park there now we will um, man I, I look at having big old dinners in that cafeteria Woo, hallelujah. You've been missing potlucks, hadn't you? Barbecue. Got ladies from Louisiana now. A number of folks from Louisiana around here. We, we'll need to have a gumbo cook-on. Now that's going to be an expensive cook-on. Shrimp's not cheap these days. Let's see. Have you been in that youth room? Dennis and I are hoping that they leave that pool table up there. That's our spiritual side. We're, we're seeing it as a place of prayer. I don't care. <laughs> I could take the table and spend an hour on it and still not have finished the game. And Brother Butler, he, he just stands and where that net's going to be stretched, just jumps up and down, swatting like he's hitting a ball. I'm telling you, we're ready. I don't know if we'll end up using the pulpit that's over there or not. Uh, they'll probably take it with them. Um, but I stand behind it. In the name of Jesus. 
you heathen. <laughs> Do that practicing because I know I'm never going to say it <laughs> when I got a live crowd there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Isn't it great being in church? Hallelujah. Come try it. Come try it. Let's stand and go to the house. God bless you. I love y'all. We got a lot of work to do between now and then. Some on the inside, some on the outside. And that weekend, just a whole lot going to be going on. We're going to need all hands on deck. That was the main point of this tonight. Love y'all. Go with God.